Hi, I'm Dr. Chris Lewis. I'm one of the chief educators here at Doctors in Training. Today we're uh, doing a pharmacology lecture on gastrointestinal drugs and anti-emetic drugs. So let's get started. First, let's talk about the drugs used for acid suppression and peptic ulcer disease. Um, so let's talk about uh, a couple of the diseases that are most commonly used for, for these problems. One is GERD, gastroesophageal reflux disease. So this is the sensation of reflux or regurgitation. Or it's the feeling I get when I try to eat a whole bucket of chicken wings uh, while watching a Real Housewives New York marathon. Don't judge me. So there's very little agreement on the diagnostic criteria for uh, the diagnosis of GERD. But it is a very common problem. There's been one study that estimated that 10 to 20 per percent of people in the Western world uh, have GERD on a weekly basis. Now the symptoms vary greatly. It includes the typical feeling heartburn, but they can have dysphagia, a persistent lump in the throat, chest pain, cough, shortness of breath, and bloating. In fact, you'll have people go uh, all the way to the ER with chest pain thinking they're having a heart attack when in fact they're just having a GERD flare-up. Mostly, most initial therapy will be guided by a patient's discomfort, so they'll come in and they'll ask for medications because they're having persistent or recurring heartburn symptoms. Invasive testing or imaging uh, is not needed until there's a treatment failure, and usually it's a treatment failure on one of the proton pump inhibitors. Next, let's talk uh, briefly about peptic ulcer disease. Now, duodenal ulcers are uh, by far the most common, and the symptoms include a burning, gnawing, hunger-like pain, and it's usually located in the epigastric area, but sometimes it can uh, be in the right upper quadrant or left uh, upper quadrant, and occasionally you'll have uh, radiation to the back, but this is less common. Uh, pain is worse on an empty stomach uh, or three to five hours after eating. Now, gastric ulcers uh, tend to worsen with food, so that's the difference between the duodenal and the uh, gastric ulcers. And the causes for uh, both types of ulcers uh, include NSAID use, overproduction of gastric acid, uh, and of course, infection with the gram-negative bacteria, Helicobacter pylori, and we'll talk about that in detail later. Diagnosis is confirmed with endoscopy, uh, though barium radiology is sometimes still used. Uh, and all patients uh, who have an ulcer need to have that H. pylori testing done uh, to ensure uh, uh, an appropriate cure, because of the recurrence rate, uh, if you don't use an appropriate antibiotic course, uh, is very high. Next, let's talk about the physiology of acid secretion. So gastric acid is secreted by parietal cells uh, in the wall of, of the stomach. Uh, parietal cells have three major receptor types, gastrin receptors, histamine receptors, and acetylcholine receptors. Now, when bound, these receptors will increase intracellular CAMP or cyclic AMP, and, would, and this subsequently will activate a protein kinase. Uh, and this will subsequently stimulate the hydrogen potassium ATPase proton pump. And this pump will secrete hydrogen ions into the stomach in exchange for potassium ions. Now there are some other cells called enterochromaffin-like cells or ECL cells. And these are adjacent to parietal cells. And they also have acetylcholine and gastrin receptors. And when they're stimula stimulated, they release histamine, uh, which then can bind to the parietal cells uh, and initiate the process we just described. Now, on a side note, prostaglandin E2 and somatostatin can decrease acid production, and we'll talk about uh, those uh, mechanisms in relation to drugs later on. So let's start with uh, some of the medications. First, we're starting off with antacids, and these have been used for centuries. They are weak bases that react with the gastric acid in the stomach to form uh, a salt and water. Now, the first one is sodium bicarbonate, and this is the same thing as baking soda or Alka-Seltzer, and it forms carbon dioxide, uh, which can uh, make belching worse. It can increase gas in, in the gastrointestinal tract. There is a very small chance of causing uh, metabolic alkalosis uh, due to the absorbed alkali uh, of this medication. And also, uh, very important, that the sodium uh, uh, part of this uh, can also cause problems with fluid retention, so you have to be careful with people with congestive heart failure or renal failure. Calcium carbonate, or Tums or OzCal, uh, as they're known uh, as an over-counter medication, it works very slowly. Uh, it still can have problems with belching and increased gas, and it can have a small increased chance of metabolic uh, alkalosis. And uh, you can also have problems with hypercalcemia. So if someone's taking this uh, all day long, uh, potentially you can't accumulate enough calcium to cause problems. Uh, the other interesting thing about uh, calcium carbonate is that it can stimulate gastrin release. So you, this can result with a uh, acid rebound. So you stop taking your Tums or your OzCal and then your heart heartburn comes back uh, with a vengeance. Next, let's talk about magnesium hydroxide and aluminum hydroxide. And these are Maalox and Mylanta as over-the-counter versions. There's no gas produced, uh, 
Uh, however, you should know this, for, especially for test reasons, is that magnesium can cause diarrhea and aluminum can cause constipation. And that's why they're used in combination, because they help counteract each other on side effects. Now, all antacids can affect the absorption of other medications, and this includes tetracyclines, fluoroquinolones, iron, and ketoconazole. So be careful when uh, giving these medications. Ask patients if they're taking these over the counter because it can cause problems. Next, let's talk about the histamine receptor antagonists or the H2 receptor blockers. And this includes cimetidine, ranitidine, famotidine, and nizatidine. Now they competitively block histamine from binding to the H2 receptors on the parietal cells. This reduces intracellular cyclic AMP, which ultimately decreases acid secretion again. These are especially good for nocturnal acid suppression. So for patients who lay down at night and they get bad GERD symptoms, um, this is a good category of medication for those people. Cimetidine is the least potent of these, and the famotidine is the most potent. Nizatidine uh, does not undergo first-pass metabolism like the other ones do. And the duration of action for these medications is about 10 hours. Let's talk about the clinical uses. So peptic ulcers. So all H2 blockers uh, promote healing of duodenal and gastric ulcers. They have mostly been replaced by the PPIs or the proton pump inhibitors, and we'll talk about those next. For H. pylori-induced ulcers, the H2 blockers uh, no longer play a role. Uh, now, the duodenal ulcers uh, take about eight uh, weeks to heal um, uh, just on the H2 blockers themselves. Uh, gastroesophageal reflux disease. Now, this is probably the, the main um, disorder where people can continue to use uh, the H2 blockers effectively for long periods of time. Um, you can use them intermittently, um, or if for more recurrent problems, you can take them uh, twice daily. Uh, it is effective in about 50% of patients, though again, the PPIs have probably replaced H2 blockers uh, uh, for the majority of patients with this problem. Another uh, clinical use is prevention of bleeding from stress-related gastritis. So one to five percent of critically ill patients in the ICU will get an ulcer or, or upper GI erosion. And you can give these medications uh, either through the nasoenteric tube uh, or intravenously. Zollinger uh, Ellison syndrome is, is a syndrome where there's a gastrin producing tumor uh, in either the pancreas or the small intestine and you can help suppress uh, acid uh, production uh, with the H2 blockers for this problem. You can use these medicines prophylactically as well. Uh, for non-H. pylori ulcers, you can give this once uh, at bedtime. And also, if someone is on uh, chronic use of NSAIDs, uh, you can use this medication to help prevent ulcer production. As a adverse effects, now these are very, very safe drugs. A lot of them are over-the-counter. Uh, it does cross the blood-brain barrier and the placenta, and is it excreted in milk, but it does carry a category B uh, pregnancy status. Less than 3% of people will have diarrhea, headache, fatigue, uh, myalgias, or constipation. Very, very rarely you can have a blood dyscrasia uh, or bradycardia. Cimetidine in particular uh, is unique because it has an anti-androgen effect, uh, which can cause gynecomastia uh, and galacteria and a, a reduced sperm count. Drug interaction, cimetidine again uh, also interferes with the cytochrome P450 um, enzyme. Next, let's talk about the proton pump inhibitors, and this includes omeprazole, lansoprazole, rabeprazole, pantoprazole, ezomeprazole, and dexlansoprazole. Now, these drugs bind to the hydrogen potassium ATPase pump in the parietal cells. Uh, the enteric coated drug is absorbed in the duodenum and then diffuses to the canaliculus of the parietal cell. It transforms into a sulfonamide cation, which forms an irreversible covalent disulfide bond uh, with the proton pump. PPIs only inhibit active pumps, uh, but the bioavailability of the drug is decreased by food. So uh, patients need to take this medication about 30 minutes to an hour before a meal, and we usually recommend breakfast. It takes one to two hours for acid suppression to set in, uh, but it lasts for 24 hours. It takes three to four days before full acid suppression uh, is reached, and it takes two to five days for full acid secretion to return uh, after stopping the medication. So for the clinical uses, well, we use this for GERD. We use this for gastroesophageal reflux disease. It's the most effective agent for non-erosive and erosive uh, reflux disease. It's good for esophageal complications of reflux, meaning peptic stri uh, stricture or Barrett's esophagus. And it's great because it's a once daily do uh, dosing in most cases, but about 15% of patients will need this twice daily. This is also used extensively for peptic ulcer disease. It'll heal a duodenal ulcer in about four weeks and a gastric ulcer in about six to eight weeks. 
Um, some people do consider using the H2 blockers for gastric ulcers because there's about the same healing time for both medications. You can use it for Zollinger Ellison syndrome as well. And then, uh, like the H2 blockers, it can be used for prevention of stress-related mucosal bleeding, uh, but uh, omeprazole is the only FDA-approved medication for this. So adverse effects, again, these are very safe medications. About 1 to 5% of people will have diarrhea, headache, abdominal pain, uh, category uh, B in pregnancy, which is nice. There is some worries about decreased B12 absorption because uh, acid is needed for the absorption of, of that vitamin. Calcium carbonate is in the same uh, uh, problem category. It needs a lower pH to be absorbed. Uh, one way to get around that, especially if you're trying to get calcium supplementation, is to switch over to calcium citrate because it doesn't need an acidic environment for absorption. Uh, decreased acid uh, may mean uh, a potential decrease in absorption of food-bound minerals like iron and calcium and zinc. And there's a possible increase in hip fractures, though this hasn't been uh, definitively uh, uh, determined. Gastric acid also helps decrease bacterial colonization in the stomach. Uh, and specifically, they've looked at uh, Clostridium difficile. Um, and because of that decreased uh, acidity, there tends to be increased bacterial counts. Again, we're not quite sure if this is uh, clinically significant. And then also what's interesting is there's an increased gastrin level when people take uh, these PPIs long term. Uh, the uh, enterochromaffin-like cells, or the ECL cells, uh, can undergo hyperplasia. And there's actually been an increased incidence of gastric carcinoid tumors in rats, though this has not been seen in humans. Drug interactions, uh, you can have decreased gastric acid, uh, which can lead to the decreased absorption of some drugs like ketoconazole and digoxin, and it is also a cytochrome P450 user. Let's move on now to antimicrobial agents for H. pylori. Um, so H. pylori is the most common chronic bacterial infection in humans. About 50% of the world's population is affected, and it's far more common in developing nations. The transmission is uncertain, but we think it's person to person, uh, probably through fecal oral routes. Um, there are some thoughts that uh, contaminated water is also another uh, cause of, of transmission. Once acquired, the infection may or may not cause uh, gastroduodenal disease. So you can have H. pylori for years and years and it never causes you any problems. So there's two major goals uh, with a uh, H. pylori uh, associated ulcer. One, we need to heal the ulcer and we need to eradicate the bacteria. Most commonly, we use a triple therapy. Uh, these are very uh, hardy bacteria and it's hard to kill them. So first you start with a two week course of a PPI, it doesn't matter really which one. Uh, and that's twice daily. And then you give clarithromycin and either amoxicillin or metronidazole. Um, usually we go with the amoxicillin unless someone is penicillin allergic and then we, we do the uh, metronidazole. Now, though this isn't part of this lecture, uh, what can metronidazole uh, cause? Well, it can cause a disulfram reaction if you drink alcohol. So if you're going to go with a triple therapy with metronidazole, you need to uh, advise them not to take uh, in, in any alcohol. So after that first two weeks, you, do, you then uh, stop the antibiotics, but you continue the PPI for another four to six weeks uh, and then uh, monitor a patient for, for recurrence. There are other types of, of therapies. There is a quadruple therapy, and again, it's a, it's a two-week therapy, and it's with a bismuth, subsalicylate, metronidazole, tetracycline, and a PPI, and there are other formulations as well. Now, why do we have to use so many drugs? Well, if you treat with just a single antibiotic, uh, you only get a 20 to 40 percent eradication rate. So you really want to, uh, uh, to use the triple or the quadruple therapy, otherwise you're, or you're just going to end up treating this patient again for the same problem. Next, let's, let's switch gears over to mucosal protective agents. So the first medication is su sucralfate, uh, and this is a salt of sucrose complex with sulfated aluminum hydroxide. In water or acidic solutions, it forms a viscous paste. And, and this binds to ulcers or erosions uh, for up to six hours. It forms a physical barrier and, and it prevents further damage to the mucosa. You do have to give it four times a day though and uh, one hour before a meal, so it is uh, irritating to have to take. And it should not be given with any antacids or any H2 blockers because it needs that acid to activate. Next, bismuth subsalicylate. Um, it has several uh, mechanisms. One is an antimicrobial action. It can also inhibit activity of pepsin. It can increase secretion of mucus, and it can coat ulcers and erosions uh, to help protect them. Now, one thing you have to be aware of is uh, a side effect of the blackening of stools. So, uh, and Pepto-Bismol is a good example. It's a very commonly used over-the-counter medication. Someone will come in thinking they're bleeding because they see this black stool, but it's really just the side effect of the medication. And it's reversible, and it doesn't cause any long-term problems. 
Next, let's talk about the prostaglandins. Um, so misoprostol is, is really the only medication in this category. It's an analog of prostaglandin E1. It stimulates mucus and bicarbonate secretion and enhances mucosal blood flow. It'll bind to prostaglandin receptors in the parietal cells and decrease cyclic AMP production. So for its clinical uses, it's usually used for uh, prevention of NSAID-induced peptic ulcers, but it has to be taken three to four times a day. It's not used very often um, due to that frequency of dosing and for its side effects. And those side effects include quite a bit of diarrhea and abdominal cramping, so in 10 to 20 percent of people. Um, and also, very importantly, it can stimulate uterine contraction, so it's absolutely contraindicated in pregnancy. It's also not a good idea to use in uh, inflammatory bowel disorders. Now let's pause for a moment and review the material that was just covered. Before we do that, if you haven't already done so, this might be a good time to read your pharmacology text that corresponds to the material that was just discussed. Then together, we'll go through the quick review in the study guide. Good afternoon. What seems to be the trouble? Are you serious, Doc? I have giant boobs. So you do. I was actually going to compliment you on them, but I didn't want to seem too forward. I'm a man. I don't want breasts. Most men like breasts. Is that maybe something you want to talk about? No, no, no. I, I like breasts. Just not when they're attached to me. Eyes up here, Doc. Uh, okay, fine. What medications are you taking? Just cymetidine, but I've been taking it for years with no issues. Well, there you have it. Cymetidine has anti-androgenic effects and can cause gynecomastia. Gyneco... what? Boobs, Bill. Boobs. Well, now that we're all done here, do you want to maybe grab a drink sometime? Maybe dinner and a movie? What? You know, for medical purposes. Hi, I'm Dr. Mike McInnes. I'm one of the chief educators here at Doctors in Training. And let's go over quick review number one. So the first question, a 45-year-old male presents with burning pain in the epigastrium. His pain is worse when he has an empty stomach. So occasionally he'll have pain that radiates to his back. And he's noticed some black stool during bowel movements. So what type of ulcer does he probably have? Well, this is most likely a duodenal ulcer. The chief clue for this is that his pain is more more pronounced when he has an empty stomach. Patients who have pain with eating typically have gastric ulcers. Uh, pain that can radiate into the back with any type of peptic ulcer, that's not really very specific. The presence of melana or the black tarry stool indicates an upper GI bleed, probably from a bleeding ulcer, and it may need to be more urgently evaluated with endoscopy. And you can also treat it endoscopically. Next question, any patient diagnosed with an ulcer must have what important test done? We need to test for H. pylori. There's lots of different ways to test for H. pylori. You can do a serum antibody test. So you just draw some blood, that's pretty convenient. Sometimes they'll do a urease breath test where they have the patient breathe and they measure uh, the urease and see if, if they have evidence of uh, H. pylori. Uh, sometimes the most definitive testing is done on microscopic examination of the, the, the sample you take from the end, endoscopy, or you can do a urease test uh, on the, uh, the tissue that you take uh, from the endoscopy. You can also do stool antigen tests. So there's lots of different ways to test for H. pylori, but you need to test for H. pylori. Without appropriate antibiotic treatment, the recurrent rate of a peptic ulcer is somewhere, you know, upwards of 60% per year sometimes as high as 100% per year. So if you don't treat H. pylori, these patients' ulcers are going to come back. With antibiotic therapy, the recurrence rate drops to less than 15%. So pretty good with treatment, much worse without treatment. Next question, what are some major causative factors of peptic ulcer disease? So one of the most important one is nonsteroidal anti-inflammatory drug use or NSAID use. These patients will go home, they've got knee pain, they've got joy pain, they've got arthritis, whatever, they're taking lots of Advil. They think, hey, ibuprofen safe, it's over the counter, I can take as much as I want. And they take lots of it, or they take one drug with this uh, NSAID in it, and another drug with this NSAID in it, and, and they're taking lots of these things, and that will uh, lead to uh, peptic ulcers. Also, we mentioned infection with Helicobacter pylori is obviously a big risk factor for peptic ulcer. 
uh, increased hydrochloric acid secretion, such as a gastrinoma. This is pretty rare, but it, it, typically a gastrinoma will present with recurrent ulcers that just don't heal very well. And inadequate mucosal defense against gastric acid. So if a patient just doesn't have good defenses against gastric acid, they're going to be more susceptible to peptic ulcers. Next question, what is the effect of prostaglandin E2 and somatostatin on acid secretion? Well, both of these hormones are going to decrease acid secretion. Next one, what adverse effect of sodium bicarbonate must you be concerned about in patients with congestive heart failure or patients with renal failure? Well, sodium bicarbonate is a great antacid, but it can cause some fluid retention. And obviously, that's a problem with the patient uh, who has any other comorbidity that's going to predispose them to uh, fluid retention, such as renal insufficiency or congestive heart failure. Next question. A patient who has been taking over-the-counter antacids now complains of worsening constipation. Well, what over-the-counter medication is this patient probably taking? Well, there are a lot of different antacids out there, and some of them contain aluminum. Uh, and the aluminum-containing antacids will cause some constipation. Magnesium antacids, on the other hand, will cause diarrhea. Many over-the-counter brands will combine both aluminum and magnesium salts in order to counteract their side effect. Next question. It's important to ask your patients if they're taking over-the-counter antacids because they inhibit the absorption of what drugs? Well, these over-the-counter antacids can inhibit the absorption of lots of different drugs, including tetracyclines, fluoroquinolones, iron, and ketoconazole. So when you're prescribing, uh, say you're prescribing tetracycline for something or maybe a fluoroquinolone, or something, you want to find out if they're taking uh, any over-the-counter antacids because that may impair the absorption of these antibiotics. So you need to take a good history when you see your patients, find out what uh, over-the-counter medications they might be taking. Next question, what is unique about the H2 blocker cimetidine? Well, cimetidine has an anti-androgenic effect, and this can cause gynecomastia, galactorrhea, and reduced sperm count. The other H2 blockers do not have this effect, and so they're much more often used. Cimetidine is very rarely used because of these anti-androgen effects. Next question. The treatment of H. pylori usually consists of a triple therapy. What is triple therapy? Well, triple therapy obviously means three drugs. In this case, uh, usually uh, you're going to use a PPI or a proton pump inhibitor twice a day for two weeks. You're going to use clarithromycin or biaxin is the brand name, and you're going to do that for two weeks. And then you're also going to use either amoxicillin or metronidazole for two weeks. And then after you've completed the, uh, the antibiotic course, you're going to continue the PPI for another four to six weeks. So you suppress acid su uh, secretion while the ulcer is healing. Next question, a patient who has had some mild diarrhea and no abdominal pain for the past several days is very concerned because now his stools have abruptly turned black. Uh, what over-the-counter medicine might this patient be taking? Well, this patient might be taking bismuth subsalicylate, which is one of the active ingredients in Pepto-Bismol. Uh, if the patient is not taking bismuth, then he may have melana, which is black tarry stool, from, usually from an upper gastrointestinal hemorrhage. Uh, and, and so you need to evaluate this patient further. You take a careful history. If this patient's been taking bismuth, you say, hey, it's probably just a bismuth, you'll be fine. When you stop that, the stool should return to normal. Um, uh, and maybe you want to, if you've got a high risk of uh, peptic ulcer and bleeding and you want to rule out an upper GI bleed, you might check the stool for occult blood. So that's the end of this quick review. Let's go back to Dr. Lewis. Next, we're moving on to the anti-emetic drugs. So, we need to talk about the mechanism of vomiting, or otherwise known as puking, throwing up, ralphing, spewing, blowing chunks, barfing, upchucking, tossing your cookies, hurling, worshiping the porcelain god, 3D burping, and my favorite, jettisoning the chunky cargo. There's some important sites for vomiting, and this includes, one, the chemoreceptor trigger zone, and this is located at the caudal end of the fourth ventricle. Uh, and this is outside the blood-brain barrier, and it's rich in dopamine receptors and opioid receptors. Uh, it may also have some serotonin and some neurokinin receptors as well. Another important site on the lateral reticular formation of the medulla, and this is called the vomiting center, and it coordinates the motor mechanisms of vomiting. Third, the vestibular system is very important, and this is particularly important in motion sickness. Uh, 
And then finally, the GI tract itself. It has the 5-HT3 serotonin receptors. And irritation of the GI tract can lead to release of uh, mucosal ser serotonin, which can affect the body as well. Next, one reason that we've come up with antiemetic drugs is for chemotherapy-induced emesis. Now, chemo drugs act on several receptors in the trigger zone, including dopamine D2 receptors and the serotonin 5-HT3 receptors. But it also irritates the GI tract directly and causes serotonin receptor activation there as well. So let's talk about anticholinergic drugs. This includes scopolamine, dimenhydrinate, meclizine, and cyclazine. Now, these are useful mostly in motion sickness. They act on the vestibular system. Uh, they're ineffective against sub substances that act directly on the chemoreceptor trigger zone. Scopolamine is a patch that the patient puts behind the ear, and often it's used for uh, boat travel or air travel. And meclizine is used to treat vertigo. You'll have a lot of patients come in with uh, room spinning sensations, and vertigo uh, is very common, especially benign positional vertigo. And meclizine can be very helpful for this. Dimenhydrinate is an over-the-counter drug used also for motion sickness as well. Next, let's talk about the phenothiazines, and this includes promethazine and procloperazine. These are the first drugs to be used uh, as antiemetics. They are antipsychotic agents, and they act through the inhibition of dopamine and muscarinic receptors. And they can cause sedation, which is their major side effect. Procloperazine uh, can cause hypotension and uh, restlessness. Now, promethazine is a very, very commonly used medication, both in the inpatient and the outpatient setting. It has an oral, an IV, and a rectal suppository form. Um, it can also block H1 receptors, and sometimes you'll see in, in books that they're actually categorized as an antihistamine. Next, let's talk about the serotonin receptor blockers. They're also known as 5-HT3 receptor blockers. And these are some of my favorite because they remind me of transformers. On Dancitron, Granisitron, Dolacitron, and Polonocitron. And they help by blocking the 5-HT3 receptors in the trigger zone. They can also block receptors in the periphery as well, the visceral vagal afferent fibers. These are the drugs of choice for chemotherapy-induced vomiting. They can be given as an IV dose 30 minutes before chemo or about an hour before chemo orally. They're well tolerated. They can cause a little bit of headache and dizziness and constipation. Um, and also the uh, dolacitron uh, can also cause a prolongation of acute QT interval, so you want to be careful with anyone with arrhythmias. Next, let's talk about the uh, butyrophenones, and this is droperidol and haloperidol. Uh, you'll recognize haloperidol is a commonly used antipsychotic, and they block dopamine receptors. Uh, droperidol is used for sedation and endoscopy procedures and in surgery, also uh, with combinations of uh, opiates and benzodiazepines. You have to be careful with these because they can also prolong the QT interval. Next, the benzodiazepines, like lorazepam and alprazolam, their benefit is probably more due to their anti-anxiety effect and uh, sedative properties. It's useful in treating anticipatory vomiting, um, especially when people are coming in for, for chemo and they're thinking about uh, the nausea coming on. Just to calm them down, these medicines can be helpful. Next, the neurokinin receptor blockers. This is a prepotent and fosaprepotent. Um, these target uh, NK1 or neurokinin 1 receptors in the brain. Uh, they're often used in combination with the serotonin receptor blockers and corticosteroids, and they can cause fatigue, dizziness, and diarrhea. As we just mentioned, corticosteroids can be used, dexamethasone, methylprednisolone, and their anti-emetic effect is not, uh, not well understood, and again, used in combination with other medications. Next are the cannabinoids, so uh, dronabinol and nabilone. Uh, their mechanism is unknown. Now, they do uh, have a psychoactive effect like marijuana. They're less often used, but sometimes they can be comboed with uh, the phenothiazines. And their side effects include dysphoria, hallucinations, uh, sedation, and vertigo. All right, let's switch gears again to the anti-diarrheals. Um, now, diarrhea, also known as Hershey squirts, the runs, Montezuma's revenge, Agent Brown, anal hot chocolate, and my favorite, trouser chili. So, diarrhea involves increased motility of the GI tract and decreased fluid absorption. Antidiarrheal meds uh, act to try to reverse these problems, and these drugs should not be used in patients with bloody diarrhea, high fever, or severe illness. Antidiarrheals can be used uh, to control chronic diarrhea as well, caused by irritable bowel syndrome or even inflammatory bowel disease. Let's start with the anti-motility drugs, uh, diphenoxalate and loperamide. Now these are opioid-like drugs with no analgesic properties, and they're derived from meperidine. They activate presynaptic opioid receptors in the enteric nervous system to inhibit acetylcholine release and decrease peristalsis. 
Now, their side effects, they can cause drowsiness, cramping and dizziness, and of course, constipation, which is again, the most common side effect of all opioids. Next is octreotide, and this is an analog of a somatostatin. Now, it has multiple effects. It inhibits multiple hormones, including growth hormone, insulin, and in this case, gastrin. Now, it reduces intestinal fluid secretion and pancreatic secretion as well. It can slow down gastrointestinal motility. It decreases blood flow to the intestine. And its clinical uses are, it can decrease uh, secretory diarrhea from VIPoma and carcinoid tumors. It can decrease diarrhea due to short bowel syndrome or, or AIDS. And then uh, other non-related to this topic, uh, clinical uses are acromegaly and uh, bleeding esophageal varices. The adsorbents, so bismuth subsalicylate, methyl cellulose, aluminum hydroxide, kaolin, and pectin, uh, they, uh, they act by uh, absorbing intestinal toxins or microorganisms. They uh, uh, absorb some of the extra fluid in the GI tract as well. They can coat and protect the intestinal mucosa. Uh, the bismuth subsalicylate also works by modifying fluid and electrolyte transports. Let's switch now to the laxatives. So you want to have a bowel movement or do a number two. Pinch a loaf, take a dump, grow a tail, back out the brown bus, drop some bombs, or again my favorite, drop the kids off at the pool. So constipation is less than two to three stools per week, or excessive straining, or very hard stools, or a feeling of incomplete evacuation. Medications that cause constipation, opioids, anticholinergics, calcium channel blockers, iron, aluminum, and anticonvulsants. So worrisome signs that cancer might be a cause of the constipation. So age greater than 50, change in stool caliber, you'll see these pencil thin stools, blood in the stool or abdominal mass, and those all need to be taken very seriously. Hypercalcemia and hypokalemia can cause constipation as well. And there's lots of common over-the-counter medications that people take. Um, now most people with intermittent constipation can control their symptoms just with a high fiber diet, uh, adequate fluid intake and regular exercise. You have to be careful with over-the-counter medications because they become habit-forming. They can cause electrolyte imbalances. And if you take these medications long-term, they can also decrease the effectiveness of medications because of the rapid transit through the gut. So let's start with the irritants and the stimulants. So uh, these medications include the anthraquinones, or cinna, or diphenylmethanes, or bisacodyl, and castor oil. Now these stimulate the enteric nervous system, colonic electrolyte, and fluid secretion. Some worry that long-term reuse can damage the uh, myenteric plexus, resulting in colonic atony and dilation, but this is probably not true. Uh, you know, this can cause an evacuation of the bowel in 8 to 10 hours, so it's the fastest acting of all the laxatives. Now, long-term use can lead to a brown pigmentation, sometimes kind of purple as well, uh, of the colon, and this is called melanosis coli. Now, there's no relation to this to colon cancer, so it, even though it looks uh, kind of gross, it, it doesn't have any major... Um, negative effects. Now castor oil is broken down to uh, ricinoleic acid uh, which is irritating to the gut and this is what increases the peristalsis and, it, and its action. Next are the bulk laxatives, so methyl cellulose, psyllium seeds or bran, and these are indigestible hydrophilic colloids that absorb water and this forms a bulky emollient gel that distends the colon and promotes peristalsis. Uh, and this is probably the safest of all the laxatives. Osmotic laxatives, and this includes magnesium hydroxide, sorbitol, lactulose, and polyethylene glycol. And these are non-absorbable salts that hold water in the intestine by osmosis. So more salts in the, in the colon, bringing water into the area. Bowel distension occurs, then increased peristalsis. Uh, polyethylene glycol is used as a uh, colonic lavage to prepare the gut for endoscopy for surgery. There's a powder version of, of polyethylene glycol called Miralax, and this is a great medication. It's even over the counter now, and it can be used for, uh, safely in children with chronic constipation. Lactulose uh, is often used uh, in hepatic encephalopathy, and this is in order to decrease nitrogenous waste buildup and absorption of ammonia, and uh, hopefully making uh, the encephalopathy better. Uh, one important fact, uh, you don't want to use a lot of magnesium in uh, renal failure patients. This magnesium can accumulate and can lead to uh, toxicity. Let's talk about the stool softener. So this is docusate and mineral oil. They're very gentle. Uh, they're used very often. They soften the stool by permitting water and lipids to penetrate the stool. And often you'll use this after surgery to uh, prevent straining and rupture of sutures. Um, you want to use this with any patient who's taking opioids because opioids, as we mentioned before, can cause constipation.
Mineral oil lubricates fecal matter, um, but you have to be careful about aspiration, so uh, uh, it can lead to a lipid pneumonitis. If you are, to, if you are going to prescribe mineral oil, uh, generally you want to tell them to take about one tablespoon a day, and you can increase, increase this by one tablespoon a day uh, until a bowel movement uh, or until you get to a max of four tablespoons a day. You do have to worry about long-term use of, of mineral oil because it can impair absorption of the fat-soluble vitamins. And what are those? ADEC, A-D-E-K. Next, let's go on to the prokinetic agents. So in general, these enhance uh, the, uh, the contractility of the GI tract and increase the transient uh, of its contents. So first, metoclopramide and domperidone. So these are dopamine receptor blockers, and dopamine has an inhibitory uh, effect on the GI tract. So these medicines will increase lower esophageal tone, and it'll stimulate gastric emptying and increase the rate of transit through the small bowel. So for clinical uses, it can be used for uh, GERD, uh, diabetic gastroparesis. It can be used to advance a nasoenteric feeding tube in critically ill patients. It can be used as an anti-emetic, especially in people uh, taking chemotherapy, uh, um, and more specifically than that, cisplatin. Adverse effects uh, include sedation, and this is an important test question, extrapyramidal side effects. So someone who has a tremor, uh, and if they're on th something like a metoclopramide, you need to remove that medication. And you can also have increased prolactin levels. Another one that we'll mention very briefly, briefly uh, bethanacol, and it stimulates muscarinic receptors. It increases intestinal motility and tone, and it's not very clinically useful. So let's talk about drugs used for irritable, irritable bowel syndrome. So in general, uh, IBS, as it's commonly referred to, is a chronic disorder characterized by abdominal pain and altered bowel habits. Usually you'll have a, a combination of diarrhea and constipation, and it's in the absence of any uh, major organic disorder. Treatment focuses on patient comfort, and IBS patients uh, are encouraged to increase their fiber intake uh, by either commercial bulking supplements or insoluble fibers like bran. So the most commonly used drugs are the antispasmodic drugs, more specifically dicyclamine and hyoscyamine, and they work mostly through anticholinergic means. They inhibit muscarinic cholinergic receptors in the enteric plexus and on smooth muscle. These can be taken on a PRM basis or, or as an as-needed uh, basis, and uh, they can also be used in anticipation of stressors uh, that are known to exacerbate their symptoms. Antidepressants are sometimes used for irritable bowel syndrome. Tricyclic antidepressants, or TCAs, uh, the serotonin norepinephrine reuptake inhibitors, or the selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors, uh, have been used in the past. There is some conflicting data on efficacy, um, but examples that have been used in the past for the TCAs include amitriptyline, imipramine, nortriptyline, and disipramine. Um, for the SSRIs, paroxetine, fluoxetine, and sertraline have been used uh, to help treat IBS symptoms. In IBS, since some do have a diarrhea uh, predominant IBS, uh, many will use antidiarrheal agents, especially loperamide, which we uh, referred to earlier. Finally, there's a medication called uh, alocitron, uh, which is a serotonin 5 uh, HT3 receptor antagonist, and it was developed specifically for uh, IBS. It decreases motility and clonic uh, secretion. It blocks visceral afferent sensation of nausea, bloating, and pain. And it's used in uh, women with diarrhea predominant IBS. Uh, now it's only used under uh, tight control uh, because of the risk of ischemic colitis and severe constipation, but you will see this medication occasionally, and it might be a good test question as well. Now let's pause for a moment and review the material that was just covered. Before we do that, if you haven't already done so, this might be a good time to read your pharmacology text that corresponds to the material that was just discussed. Then together, we'll go through the quick review in the study guide. Halt! Who goes there? I am the Buchanator, the ruler of regurgitation, the overlord of emesis, the supervisor of throw-up. Supervisor? Nice one, Lewis. Dude, stay in character! Sorry. I am the Pikinator, and your chemo receptor triggers an instant no chance against my ferocious luxury. You do not frighten me, Pikinator, for I am on Dancitron, the oldest and wisest of 5-HT3 serotonin antagonists. Curses, my oldest foe. That's right. 
Now that pumps that mad and vomiting or chemotherapy induced vomiting Just stand and chance against the mighty power of our Dancitron Together with my brothers, Predicitron and Dolacitron You shall be defeated You will be forever banished from our peaceful planet <laughs> No fair! You guys can't gang up on me! I'm gonna tell mom! Mom? All right, let's go over quick review number two. The first question, what anticholinergic, anti-emetic drug is used to treat vertigo? Well, this is meclizine, very commonly used for vertigo. Next question, what are the drugs of choice for chemotherapy-induced vomiting? Primarily, these are the 5-HT3 receptor blockers, the serotonin-3 receptor blockers. Next question, what anti-emetic drugs can cause prolongation of the QT interval and should be used with caution in patients with known arrhythmias? Well, these include the 5-HT3 receptor blockers, specifically dolancitron, and also the butyrophenones can cause prolongation of the QT interval. So lots and lots of drugs will cause prolongation of the QT interval, and you want to be aware of these so you don't combine too many of them. Or in a patient who already has prolonged QT interval, you want to watch very closely for any worsening because that may predispose to life-threatening arrhythmias. Next question, a female patient has just recovered from a C-section and is having ongoing problems with constipation. She's being treated for some mild anemia caused by her surgery and has been taking pain medication for her incision pain. What are the probable causes of her constipation? Uh, so there are a couple of different things that could be uh, leading to constipation in this patient. One would be opioids because of her post-operative pain. It's not at all uncommon to discharge these patients with uh, a prescription for an opioid, an oral opioid such as hydrocodone, and those opioids will definitely cause some constipation. Also, iron supplementation. This is often overlooked as a cause of constipation. Some patients may need a stool softener while they're taking iron supplements. So if a patient has constipation, you need to look for all the potential causes. Don't just assume it's the opioid. It may be the iron supplement also. Uh, don't you love the way in these questions we often give these patients three or four things that can all, all, all cause the same side effect. So, uh, Next question. A 65-year-old male presents with a new onset constipation. He complains that his stool seems thinner than before, and he believes he's losing weight despite a normal appetite. What should be ruled out first in this patient? So this patient's got a couple of uh, worrisome signs and symptoms. One, he's noticing a change in his stool caliber. His stools used to be nice and thick and bulky, now they're getting thinner. And sometimes they're described as pencil-thin stools or ribbon-like stools. Uh, this could indicate a mass lesion, and we're worried about a colon cancer in this patient. Also, he thinks he's losing weight despite a normal appetite, weight loss despite normal appetite, uh, you know, especially patients who, you know, maybe they weren't intending to lose weight or maybe they were intending to lose weight and they thought that diet was finally working and now they can't seem to stop losing weight. Uh, and so that's a worrisome uh, situation and you want to look for some malignancy. So in this patient, um, you know, high on the list would be a colon cancer, which can cause weight loss, fever, pencil thin stools, abdominal masses, uh, and you need to start screening your patients for colon cancer at age 50, even if they have no significant risk factors. Patients will also often balk at this and say, well, I'm, I'm fine, there's no history of colon cancer in my family. You say, I don't care, you're 50 years old, you need to get your colonoscopy, you need to get screened for colon cancer. Next question, what osmotic laxative is used to treat patients with hepatic encephalopathy? Well, this is lactulose. Next question, why should mineral oil be taken in an upright position? Well, you want to avoid aspiration, and, and you can aspirate the mineral oil, and then you get this lipid pneumonitis. So you want to tell the patient to make sure they take it in an upright position. Now, I don't know if you've ever tried drinking something when you're lying down. It's pretty difficult, but anytime you're reclining at all, it can increase the risk of aspiration. So have the patient sit up before they take the mineral oil. Next question. A diabetic patient, while being treated for mild nausea and GERD, begins to have tremor in his hands. What medication is he taking that might be causing this adverse reaction? Well, the drug we're looking for here is metoclopramide. Metoclopramide is used for diabetic gastroparesis or gastroparesis, where you have basically paralysis of the stomach, and the stomach's not able to contract, and the food stays in the stomach, and they get bloating, and they get nausea, and they get vomiting. It's basically a type of peripheral neuropathy that, instead of affecting the feet, affects the stomach. So uh, diabetic gastroparesis, 
and we treat this with metoclopramide. Unfortunately, metoclopramide can cause some extra pyramidal side effects, uh, and you can stop those side effects by stopping the metoclopramide. The next question, dicyclamine and hyoscyamine are used most often for what problem? Well, these are two drugs that are often used to treat irritable bowel syndrome. So this is going to help with the spasms and the cramping and the discomfort associated with IBS. So that's the end of quick review number two. Now's a good time to pause the video and complete the end of session quiz and then we'll go over those answers. All right, let's go over the answers to the end of session quiz. The first question, match the medication with its appropriate drug category. So the first drug there, omeprazole, is of course a proton pump inhibitor. The next drug is ranitidine. This is uh, an H2 receptor antagonist or a histamine receptor antagonist, an H2 blocker. The next drug, a prepotent. This is a neurokinin receptor blocker. The next one, scopolamine, is an anticholinergic. And the last drug there, ondansetron, is one of the serotonin 5-HT3 receptor blockers. Next drug, what is triple drug therapy for H. pylori infections? Again, uh, it's a PPI twice a day for two weeks, clarithromycin for two weeks, and then either amoxicillin or metronidazole for two weeks. And you usually d decide, you know, which one to use. If, if the patient is allergic to penicillin, then obviously you can't give amoxicillin, you'd give metronidazole. Um, and then after you finish the antibiotics, you're going to continue the PPI for four to six weeks. Next question, what are the side effects associated with magnesium hydroxide and aluminum hydroxide? So the magnesium hydroxide antacids will cause diarrhea. Remember, magnesium causes diarrhea. Sometimes you'll, you'll use milk of magnesia for constipation, or a patient who's getting a bowel prep for surgery or for a colonoscopy may be given magnesium citrate. That magnesium stimulates the bowel, causes diarrhea. Then aluminum will cause constipation. Next one, a patient complains of epigastric pain with eating. He has a long history of gastroesophageal reflux disease, or GERD, but he's not been taking any medication lately. What's his likely diagnosis, and what should you do next? Well, again, epigastric pain with eating is suspicious for gastric ulcer, so the patient needs to be tested for H. pylori to determine whether or not he needs antibiotics and a proton pump inhibitor. Next question, name an appropriate therapeutic option for each of the following clinical scenarios. So the first scenario is a 53-year-old woman is on chemotherapy and is very nauseated. Again, you want to use one of those serotonin receptor blockers on Dancitron would be a good choice. Very commonly used for chemotherapy. The next scenario, a 34-year-old woman with Zollinger-Ellison syndrome, you need to use a proton pump inhibitor. So maybe omeprazole or one of the other proton pump inhibitors. And then the third scenario, a 48-year-old man needs symptomatic relief from mild GERD. Uh, you could use a proton pump inhibitor, but more likely mild GERD, just now and then, you're going to use uh, something that's less expensive, and that would be one of the H2 receptor blockers such as ranitidine. Next question, why should patients potentially not use stimulant laxatives for extended periods of time? Well, there's a potential for atonic colon with prolonged use of these stimulant laxatives. Uh, there are some resources that state this is not as common as we first thought, but there are still patients who will present with chronic constipation who seem to be completely unable to defecate without using a stimulant laxative. It's like they're hooked on their stimulant laxatives. So be aware of that. And you try not to use those stimulant laxatives for extended periods of time. Next question. A 50-year-old male comes to your clinic because he's developing breasts. Never a good thing. Uh, his only medication is cimetidine, which he's been on for about six years. He wants to know, is this possible that this drug is responsible for this new change? The answer is yes. Cimetidine has anti-androgenic effects. It can cause gynecomastia, and that's not going to occur with any other H2 receptor blockers. So the easy thing to do is to switch him from cimetidine to ranitidine or one of the other H2 blockers. Next question, how does sulcrophate work? Uh, in water or, or acidic solution, it forms a viscous paste, and it binds to the ulcers or the erosions for up to six hours. So it forms a physical barrier to prevent further damage to the mucosa. Next question, what enzyme is inhibited by the proton pump inhibitors? Well, it's the proton pump, the uh, hydrogen potassium ATPase pump. The last question, what antiemetic fits the following clinical description? So the first one, most common antiemetic used in inpatients is promethazine. The brand name of this is Phenergan. You'll see it given orally 
It can be given rectally. It can be given IM or IV, although those, uh, the IV use is not, uh, is an off-label use. It's not FDA approved for IV use, but it's very commonly used IV uh, for nausea. The next one, commonly used to treat nausea associated with vertigo and dizziness. This is meclizine. Next one, useful in treating emesis in cancer patients who are taking cisplatin. This is metoclopramide. The next one, we, we talked about this, a diabetic with gastroparesis and GERD. You might use metoclopramide. The next one, used for emesis post-op and during cancer chemotherapy. This is ondansetron, very commonly used for cancer chemotherapy, nausea. And then finally, the antiemetic with side effects of hypotension and restlessness. This is prochlorperazine. So that's the end of the end of session quiz and the end of your gastrointestinal drugs lecture. Thank you very much.